Always. We ask the questions. What is needed in the world? What is that going to be? Millions of emails and phone calls registered in secret by American intelligence agencies. Now keeping an eye on all of us, regardless of our citizenship. The backlash is particularly fierce in the European Union. Its Justice Commissioner is demanding explanations from the American Attorney General, Eric Holder. In the meantime, authorities in Britain are cracking down on journalists exposing the spy scandal forcing the Guardian newspaper to destroy its hard drives. The highest law enforcement official in the EU, Vivian Redding, responsible for protecting the privacy of citizens. Is she doing anything about all this? Can she do anything? And does the American government even care? We'll find out today on Talk to Al Jazeera. Vivian Redding, thank you for agreeing to talk to Al Jazeera. As an EU citizen yourself, how did you react when you first heard the revelations from the former US consultant, Edward Snowden, regarding the large scale surveillance of phone calls and emails in the EU? Well, I thought that was a very welcome wake up call because uh, there are now nearly two years that uh, we are working on the reform of the data protection rules in Europe. And although citizens are very aware of uh, uh, their not being secure when they are uh, online, uh, politicians sometimes are reluctant to have new rules. Having strong data protection rules is not a luxury. It is simply a question of trust into the new media. And you see, uh, Europeans are very keen on data protection, maybe because of their history. The trust uh, in what is done with your personal data is not very high. And that might be the reason why data protection as a must, as an obligation, is inscribed in our fundamental laws, in our treaties, in our charter of fundamental rights. So for Europeans, it is a basic value and a fundamental right. It was, of course, Edward Snowden, the former computer consultant who leaked the secret information about the American spy operations. But it's really this man now who is at the center in terms of global legal ramifications, the American Attorney General Eric Holder, the highest law enforcement official in the United States. After the scandal broke, Vivian Redding sent Eric Holder a letter demanding he respond to a few questions. Among them, are the Americans gathering information on EU citizens? Are they a primary target? How do the Americans define national security? What actions does he suggest EU citizens and companies take if they want to challenge US authorities? And do EU citizens have the same legal rights in this regard as American citizens? You wrote to the US Attorney General, Eric Holder, and you asked him some very specific questions about the scope and nature of this surveillance. What was his response? Well, we had seen Eric Holder in a meeting in, um, uh, in Ireland shortly after the scandal erupted. And um, my colleague from the United States uh, was uh, very shocked too, I think, about the amplitude of what has happened. And uh, we uh, set up a transatlantic uh, uh, group of experts, uh, both from secret service and from data protection, in order to have a look at the details of what has happened, on uh, how the rules uh, have not been applied, and what needs to be done in a transatlantic uh, collaboration in order that this does not happen again. But you asked some very specific questions. For example, you asked whether it was specifically or particularly um, foreign citizens, EU citizens, 
who are being subjected to this? Did he answer that question? Well, at that moment, uh, we set up these expert groups in order to find out really the details. And since that moment, a lot of more details have come uh, to the open. Uh, so uh, what was uh, feared by some of uh, the members of uh, parliament uh, in the United States uh, appeared to be uh, real. Uh, that means it was also American citizens who have been spied on. And that changed the um, view uh, the American politicians uh, have on these uh, legislations. There are more and more voices being heard in the United States asking to uh, set up rules both sides of the Atlantic. And that is what I have been calling for such a long time. We need not to oppose each other, but we need to bridge rules which are fair in the United States and rules which are fair in Europe and European citizens in the United States having the same possibility to defend themselves as American citizens in Europe do have already today. Were you able to get more detail on the nature and scope of the surveillance? Because you did ask him in that letter whether it was purely to do with security matters or whether in fact the surveillance went broader. That is exactly the kind of questions we will uh, handle in a bilateral uh, meeting which is going to take place in the next coming uh, weeks. And uh, we will have then on the table uh, the uh, results of this uh, uh, US-EU uh, expert group and we will analyze this one in detail and see if the rules which we had set up in the, in the past are enough but I have the impression that those rules were bypassed and that companies were forced to give out data of their clients. So what can you do then in your role and your position in Europe as um, enforcing justice and defending the rights of the individual to actually ensure that um, European citizens' privacy um, the right to have their data and to know what's being done with their data. What can you do to actually protect Europeans against this kind of infringement? Two things. First, to have uh, this bilateral agreement uh, where we are discussing now two and a half years uh, between Europe and the United States for the exchange of data uh, in uh, questions of security. And second, to have the reform of our data protection rules in Europe implemented. Is this going to pass? You came up against a lot of opposition before. What makes you confident that it will be different this time? The sheer dimension of the problem uh, becomes uh, so huge that I think that there will not be a government in Europe which can oppose to have stronger and more applicable rules with teeth, as I always say, so that the data protection of the individuals in Europe, that can also be of Americans in Europe, will be protected and that companies will not be in this conflict anymore. Uh, do I um, give in? to an American demand which is illegal uh, or do I stick to the rules? I hope that if we do have the new rules with the sanctions behind, then they will stick to the rules. Do we have any idea about what exactly is being done, how this data that's being collected has been used? Well, I really wonder. Uh, because if you do not have very sophisticated means of analyzing this bulk of data, uh, this data will m be more a hindrance than a help. If you are not going uh, in a very um, uh, uh, concentrated way on looking for something specific, uh, then you are in front of a mountain of data on how to get out what you really need. I really wonder about the efficiency of the system as it has been set up by some uh, secret service organizations. Now there have been some reports that the data that's being collected hasn't merely been kept and used in the United States. There have been reports that some of it has been shared, um, for example, with Israel or other countries, maybe in the Middle East, which the United States has the habit of sharing this kind of information with. Do you know anything about this? And what concerns should EU citizens have about their data being analyzed um, by other countries? 
and also by European countries, which seem not to have sticked uh, to their own uh, rules very strongly. So all this has to come to the open. And then we have to take together decisions. Uh, because secret services are very important in order to preserve the security of our societies, but they are not over and above the law. They have also to obey to the law of their uh, member states where they operate. Uh, sometimes there are specific laws in order to allow them to act urgently in case of danger. And that is normal. Each society should have that. But bypassing the law cannot be normal for anybody, also not for secret services. How seriously do you think the US Attorney General has taken your concerns? How satisfied have you been with his response? Well, I will see him together with my colleague Cecilia Malmström, who is responsible uh, for security questions. We will uh, meet him and we will really put everything on the table in order to see how we can uh, proceed so that things like that do not happen again. Now, of course, there was a lot of media coverage of Edward Snowden and his revelations. But of course, there are other whistleblowers on both sides at the Atlantic. What kind of protection do you think should be put into place to enable whistleblowers to bring important information to the public attention? The protection of sources is already granted in many member states uh, for people who give inf important information to states in order states to defend themselves. Um, but it has never been foreseen that uh, people who give information to the general public uh, can be protected. We are in a rather new um, uh, phenomenon and this uh, needs a lot of uh, brilliant lawyers to think about how they this can be handled in the member states uh, system of law. And yet it is really at the heart of the subject that we're talking. You know, we're talking about um, data, we're talking about the, the scandal that broke because of revelations of a whistleblower. Is this something maybe that now needs to be looked at on an, a European level rather than just on a national level? These kinds of laws uh, are linked to the national judiciary system. And the uh, European Union has uh, no intention to change the national judiciary system. So I do believe that uh, these are questions which have to be handled at the level of the nation state. Talking of nation states, if we could look at um, a case study recently regarding data in the United Kingdom. Um, obviously, it was the Guardian newspaper there that was the recipient of much of um, Edward Snowden's revelations. Um, in your capacity as the, the EU um, Justice Commissioner, do you think that the UK authorities were within their rights um, obliging the Guardian newspaper to destroy um, those computers and those hard disks containing the information? Well, as a former journalist, I have been working as a journalist during 20 years and also, I was also um, president of the journalist union in my country. Uh, I have always been fighting for uh, journalists to be able to protect their sources. And here there is a real conflict on protecting their sources. So I have serious doubts as a former journalist on uh, the legality uh, and the way a democracy is functioning if this goes to the right direction, as has been happening with an important newspaper in uh, the United Kingdom. And I have been astonished, really astonished, that there were not more voices of protest uh, being raised all over the planet when this happened. Since the American spy operations were disclosed, only one person has so far been detained by legal authorities as a result. This man, David Miranda. He's the partner of Glenn Greenwalt, the American journalist working for the British newspaper, The Guardian, who broke the story. Miranda was detained by British authorities at Heathrow Airport on his way back to Brazil after meeting with one of Greenwalt's collaborators on the story. Miranda was held for nine hours under British anti-terror provisions and information he carried on computers was seized. 
I stayed in a room with six different agents who were coming in and going out. They spoke to me, asking me questions about my whole life. They took my computer, my video game, cell phone, everything. Do you think that the UK authorities were within their rights to behave like this towards a partner of a journalist? Well, I have a very big confidence uh, into the British judiciary system. That's a solid one, a very independent one. And I think it will be a very interesting story for them to analyze. Uh, I only can repeat what I have said before. I do believe that uh, journalists, as long as they do not uh, go completely against national laws, because that journalists uh, are not allowed to do either, but journalists, while they are doing their analysis work, they should have the right to uh, keep their sources for themselves. If they cannot, then analytic work by the journalists will not be possible anymore, and that will be the end of the freedom of speech and of the free press. Now, in both these cases, in the case of the Guardian newspaper, the, the laws that have been evoked have been anti-terrorism laws. Do you fear across Europe that increasingly um, these anti-terrorism laws are being used as a catch-all to really um, impede journalists and others in doing their work when maybe what they're revealing is something which the authorities would prefer remain secret? After 9-11, worldwide, the laws on anti-terrorism were reinforced, rightly so, because it was a very big shock. And member states, governments, wanted to protect themselves and their citizens against possible attacks. So it was logical at that moment that the security part of the legislation was overdone. Uh, now I think we have to come back to an equilibrium. There has to be an equilibrium between the rights of the individual and the security of the society. And one is not an enemy of the other. Both have to be in uh, the two sides of the same coin uh, somehow. And it is very important that we review. Haven't we gone too far in some of our legislation rightly so at a certain time of history, and don't we need to re-equilibrate uh, the laws so that security and rights are in balance, or do not become exclusive? Now, in your contacts with EU citizens across the European Union, what is the impression that you're garnering from them? Are they feeling that it has gone too far in the way of um, security and in fact that their privacy and their individual rights are being too much infringed now? Well, I can only tell you about European uh, citizens and their feeling that their personal data is misused. Not only by the states, they also feel that it is misused uh, in, um, in the commercial uh, uh, environment. And uh, my big fear is that uh, if they continue to have this opinion and if they develop it, uh, develop, if they develop it to a psychosis, uh, then the whole new economy, the internet economy, the new startups which need the data of the individuals will run into trouble. And that is why I appeal to all those who have economic and political responsibility, let's do the laws which bring back to the citizens the feeling that their data uh, dans la mesure du possible, uh, like everything is possible or impossible in human life, can be protected. Sometimes the argument you hear from politicians is, well, if people are not involved in any wrongdoing, what have they got to be afraid of? I mean, how would you respond to that? Well, why then did we have the letter secrecy some time ago? And isn't it the same when I send you an email? It is like a letter today. So uh, why do we change uh, the way we are looking at things just because the technology has changed? We always say as responsible politicians, what is a crime online is a crime offline and what is a crime offline is a crime 
online. So why shouldn't be what is a protection of the person offline? It should also be the protection of the person online. I do not believe that we should because the media changes have a change of our rules, of our beliefs, of our values. You've spoken about um, regulations, about laws that can be introduced in order to um, enhance protection. What about actually the technology itself? For example, we've heard of this so-called BRICS cable being constructed from Russia to China, South Africa around to Brazil to actually have an infrastructure which is independent of the United States and therefore theoretically their surveillance. Is that the way ahead, do you think? Well, I would not like uh, a wrong uh, assumption to come up that here we are speaking against the United States. Because have we analyzed what kind of behavior other parts of the world are having according to the rules of protection of the individual? I'm not sure we would come to a very positive result if we would do that. And that is why uh, this is not a war against the United States. This is simply setting up by responsible politicians the defense measures so that citizens can feel at ease, that citizens know, yes, my rights are preserved wherever I am going. And that is also why I believe very much in inbuilt uh, protection, uh, data protection by design or by default, uh, for instance. And I do not believe in big constructions and thinking because they are big and new, they are secure. Not necessarily. It depends on who is handling the instruments, if the instruments are secure or not. What kind of recourse do EU citizens have at the moment um, if they believe or they find out that their data has been accessed, for example, in the United States illegally? How can they challenge that? They cannot challenge that if they are EU citizens living in the EU. Uh, American citizens living in uh, or, or traveling uh, in uh, the EU can challenge that in the EU. We cannot challenge it in the United States. And that is why I am asking from our American uh, counterparts uh, to have uh, an equal treatment of American citizens and of European citizens. Both should have the right to complain and both should have the right to judicial redress, Americans and Europeans alike. Is it in your experience something that really has grassroots support now? I mean, do you feel that there is a lot of outrage in Europe that this kind of surveillance has been going on? The outrage is uh, very huge because it is not only uh, the question of uh, the personal uh, data uh, um, of, of communication, it is also uh, the data in the banks, uh, the data entrusted to administrations. So it is an overall feeling uh, that you cannot trust anymore the authorities. And that for a democracy is very, very negative uh, because citizens should feel, feel protected uh, by the democracies, by their governments, uh, by their institutions. That is the way a democracy works and that is why I have also raised my voice and uh, gave a warning uh, to all the political responsible people just handle it in such a way that people can regain respect and trust. We need this. Now, people are counting on you because ultimately the buck stops with you. You are responsible for guaranteeing fundamental rights in the EU. Are you confident that you are doing enough to protect EU citizens in this way? You are never doing enough. But you have to start to do it and to do it as strongly and as quickly and as massively you can. But you are not alone because a system to work needs a lot of actors. The European Union can make proposals. Those proposals have to be agreed by the member states. They have to be agreed by the 
European Parliament and the implementation has to be on the whole continent so that there are many, many actors. It does not depend on one person alone. It depends on an integrated system of responsible politicians and administrators in order to get that functioning. And I make an appeal to all those governments and to all the members of parliament, take your responsibility. Citizens are looking at what you are doing. Vivian Redding, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. It was a pleasure.